My question to you is, was Brel for you a conduit to Gogo? Well, I, you know, I, I mean, to be very honest with you, before I came to see the exhibition, I didn't really know an awful lot about Gauguin as, 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 as an artist. Um, so it was a real education f f for me. I, I, I kind of knew that, 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 that Brel was sort of buried with, I didn't realise, next n n near Gauguin, buried next to, to Gauguin. So, so it, it was a very kind of, it's been a whole education for me, this, this, this exhibition, because uh, um, Gauguin's not an, an, an artist I have really kind of, I consider a favourite artist of, 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 of mine. But now I've kind of been, I've seen lots of parallels to lots of early Picasso as well, and I love early Picasso. My favourite painting, and on this is very kitsch, I'm telling you, but my favourite painting is Boy with Pipe by, by, by Picasso. And there's actually a, a painting of Gauguin's that's a very echo, an echo of that painting. Mm -hmm. So, so with, with, with a female, with, with, with a lady sort of with, with flowers and, and surround and similar sort of colours. So you, you can see that the Picasso had an, an influence, an influence from Gauguin. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, it's so, I, I never connected both, but now it's, it's, it's made a connection for me now. It's also, I also think, I'm, I'll be wrong there, I'm off my track, but I think Gauguin's a painter who's not talked so much about in English, in English circles, I think. It's not one you have to know, you know, you'll know about Picasso, Braque, all these people, but possibly not Gauguin. Well, I, I think, I think that you always see the same few sort of, sort of Gauguin sort of paintings, you know, you're always the same sort of, sort of famous ones. And, and in a way, when a painting is, is seen on you so much and seen, it becomes almost like, a, almost, almost like a kitsch thing, in a way, a kind of kitschness to, um, to it. So you don't really kind of, you don't appreciate it fully, but then, th then when I've come here today, I've seen actually the actual pictures and the, and the actual paintings themselves, it's kind of a fascinating, it's been a fascinating education that, you know, I, I thought before I came here, I wasn't keen on Gauguin as, as an artist, but now I really love Gauguin as an artist, and I really kind of feel so much, and I've just loved this exhibition, I love the paintings, and seeing them close up, seeing the colours, seeing all the kind of, there's so much in them that I, that I never, never realised, and seeing how his, his figures from his um, Tahiti paintings, how he, he was kind of so disillusioned, because he, he, when, he, when he went there and he felt he wanted to get paradise and magic and his fantasy idea of what Tahiti was, and then going there and find it kind of um, uh, colonised and the colonial and everything. So, so his paintings are very much how he wants Tahiti to be, and this colourful, bright thing. But all the figures in his paintings look miserable. They all, they all they look glum, they look kind of expressionless and kind of slightly sad. So there's a slight real sadness into them. So there's much more of a depth in a, to the, the, the paintings that I haven't really realised. Can I, this is, this is, this is, <laughs> this is, is, is there a parallel to you as well? Because I think, you know, through your music all the way, the last 30, 35 years, I should say, there's always been a search for intensity, or at least when you listen to your music, it's invigorating. There's wanting the world to be as... As a lie. Yeah, as I, I, I think I, I think I, I do o o o always colour up my my songs in in a world that I want I want it to be. That's kind of much more coloured up than it actually is, um, and I think that I think that's I think that's a kind of it's a mixture of of the kind of romantic in me I think, and I think I sometimes veer in songs between a romantic and a cynic, but a cynic is sometimes is a disillu disillusioned romantic. It's a cliche, a disillusioned romantic, and that very much, and so when I find myself becoming cynical I always search for the kind of m the, the magical and the fantastical and everything and I think I've always had this mythical side in, in, in a th thing that runs through my songs I like kind of references to myths and and fantasies and and and, and dreams and and life is a much how I kind of imagine it through a rose tinted way sometimes and try to kill the cynic to try to get rid of the cynic. I think with soft cell I wrote more as a, as a cynic for my own so solo work I've written more as a romantic get back to feeling of being a more of, of a Romantic. It's squalor and glamour. It says it all. It's well, yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's the two. It's the two. It's the two things. But that's. I'm very much to have these two sides um, to me. They're always kind of fighting angel and devil. You know, glamour and squalor. I mean, we can go through all the cliches. <laughs> but but it's kind of. Um, it's true. I think it's always. There's always been this fighting. I think that's, that's going on in, in, in me and, and, and my work between um, the, the things that I write, the, the, what I want things to be, and what things really are like. I mean, with Soft Cell, we, 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 we always thought we were like a, the, 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 showing the real of what Britain was really like at that time in, in, in conservative Margaret Thatcher's Britain. We were always the sort of dirt behind the door, you know, the, the dirt under the carpet, the things, the 
sleazy sort of sideshows and the things like that. It was really kind of a, um, you know, it was really about that. Whereas a lot of people in, in that time in the early 80s were making very glamorous pop, you know, in, in this sort of glamorous view of the 80s. But we had a slightly seedy, tainted sort of, very apt, of course, very um, a view of what, what of what life was really like. That's true. It's funny. I was watch, I'm watching uh, Ashes to Ashes, you know, that TV series where. Oh yes, which, which gets back, been back from 2008 to 2009. I never saw Ashes to Ashes, but I never. Unfortunately, it was one of the series that I never ever caught mm. up with. So, uh, but I hear it's a great series, so I've got to catch up with it. So that's interesting. Exactly that yeah. point. It's, 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 it's you know looking at uh, Thatcherite Britain from the past and exactly of all the facets of what the season has split to. Um, well, you know, to people going, you know, glamour crazy. Or, you know. Yeah, well, it, well, it's like the seventies. I mean, I mean, I could kind of do a, my teenage years were really in, in the seventies, and that's when I first went to, went to art college. And of course, seventies. You think back in seventies, and you think, and you think glam rock, you know, and Roxy Music, and David Bowie, and T Rex, and all these sort of groups, and from the seventies. But the seventies was actually a really grim time, really. So you look back, and it wasn't the seventies wonderful, wasn't it great? And it wasn't. It was power cuts and kind of strikes and rubbish bags piled in the streets. And that's probably why, why, why glam rock came along as an antidote to that. And then punk came along, which really showed, that let's get back to the truth again. Let's get back to the truth of what it's really like in, 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 in Britain at, at, at that time. And I, I love that all the way through the 70s. It's that thing, you get, you get kind of, the 70s starts with like blues rock, which was like dirty kind of blues rock and, and kind of men in kind of, you know, jeans and playing blues rock. Then you get glam rock. Then you get back to reality again with punk. And and, um, and 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 with the, and then you get back to disco. You get disco and electro, which was like so. All these times, I love these kind of phases that we kind of go through in Britain between the reality of let's face this, dig up, stick our faces in the dirt and see what it's like, and then let's celebrate and become. And then, now we're sick of that. So let's 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 get glamorous and makeup on and, and and glitter and things and go against that. And we've always had that, I think, in Britain. And it's what make, makes fascinating about musical cultures in Britain, which we don't unfortunately have so much anymore. It's true, isn't it? Talking about the seventies, I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Was were you know you did Amsterdam today? Were Bowie and Alex Harvey your quantity? Oh yeah, yeah. Did you discover them yourself? They, they were my doorway in, 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 into Brel. I mean, I, I kind of discovered Brel through a, through a number of singers around the same time, and it was really through through first of all through through Bowie. I switched, I flipped over a single Bowie had called Sorrow, and it was the B side of Sorrow called Amsterdam. And I thought. I'd never heard a song that talked about whores and pissing in it and things like that and, and all that kind of, you know, gritty street sort of language. And then, then there was a song he did My Death and Jack Brill again and then Alex Harvey did Next and, um, and things and then, and then we had Scott Walker and so all, the, so all at once we were hearing this name Brell around the same period of time in the 70s. So and I just heard these songs and I just thought, these are great, fantastic songs and never, I never heard words in these songs. I know they were kind of... British translations that weren't always as, as, as true as, as true as they could be, but they were still really great sort of sort of songs that were about celebrating this grittiness and reality of life. But what was? But, but Brel as well. There's a romanticism to Brel as well. Again, that other side of thing. You know, that they, they, you, you have these kind of the gritty things, songs about death and about life and whores and the street and Amsterdam and you know and about. Um, kind of political song. I mean, a song like, like Le Diable Savard, Devil OK, is so political and it's so current and relevant to now. All, every line in it is like spookily relevant to now. But at the same time, there's this real romanticism to Brel as well. Like, and I suppose going to, you know, following in the, in the steps of um, Gauguin and looking for this thing that Gauguin was, was, was looking for, the, this magical place, this adventure, this um, uh, paradise. You know, and the, sa the savage, real sort of paradise and everything. Uh, he, he, he was looking for that. I said, things again, it's that, it's that cynic and the romantic, the cynic, the romantic fighting against the cynic, isn't it? There's one thing, but the other thing is that what will make, will make great artists and what, what great music is you have a thing, they have some sort of secret knowledge, and you want that knowledge. You know what I mean? It's, it's like you, you, yeah. you listen to, to John, Jim Morris and you think, OK, I'm not sure what he's talking about, but he knows more than I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, want yeah. that. Yeah, and the yeah, Brel's yeah. the same sort of thing. So yeah. through the world of it, it, it's a different way to taking you into a world that, is, is, that, that exists where, where, where you don't get a chance to go into. Where you got, you're stepping into, into, into another world, and you do feel that they know something that you don't, and you want, you want that secret of life that, that, um, that, that, that they have. Certainly, 
Jim Morrison. You know, so, so when, when I was a teenager, Bowie showed me another world. You know, sitting on my sofa at home with my parents and David Bowie was, was really like an alien from another planet. You really didn't believe he was, you know. And I remember being at school and people said, I remember Eno from Roxy Music. And everyone said he, he said he was an alien from another planet. He played alien sounds on a synthesizer. I mean, really did believe it. So it was that, um, you know, you, people taking you into these different worlds and different places. I, I, and I've always wanted to try and do that with my own mm. songs and my own music in a way, take people in, into kind of my world. You've been singing Braille for more than 30 years. And obviously, you know, one changes physically as one grows older. One confidence, I don't know, just, just one of the... How do you say your approach to his songs has changed? Oh, it's much better. Uh, it's totally different now because I think I probably, when I first started singing Braille, I really didn't so much have the experience of, of, of life so much. Some experience to sing some of the songs I was singing. And I, I, but, but now I've kind of grown into a lot of the, the, those songs a lot. I've had the experience, much more experience of life because they are songs that you need experience, not, not naivety, you know. So as, as you get older, you grow into those songs a lot more. The great thing about Braille songs, you can sing them when you're 60 and you don't even have to be singing them in tune, really. You, you, you can kind of, they're singing, acting songs. Like I think there's a German, there's a German word called sh 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 speak sing. Okay. Where, where, where a and something, I don't know what that word is. Sprechgesang. Sprechgesang, yeah. Where you speak, sing. So I always think, well, if I didn't ever had a singing voice anymore, I, 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 if at all, I could still, I could still do Braille, and, you know, because, it, to, because they're, they're, they're songs that you can act and you can get into a character and, pl and play. What do you like about this painting in particular and what kind of song would you play with it? What kind of music would you associate with it? Well, uh, I feel like a lot of the songs, it's, it's a weird thing, when I was listening to the, the, the sort of paintings, I think it's odd, and I suppose the obvious thing would people would say Hawaiian music, but it's not, for me it's like an, accord, like a, an accordion, because I, I think of him being on the ship to go to these places, you know, I, th I think of that painting where he, he's the traveller, in this painting, and he's a traveller, so I'm thinking, what was the most surprising th thing to find out about, 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 about um, Gauguin to me, was that he was Victorian. Because, because I had no, I actually thought, I mean, this is very ignorant. I thought he was much, much more contemporary than, than that. And I thought he might have been 1940s or something like that. So being a Victorian and going on a ship to Tahiti was quite an a, a amazing journey. So you imagine kind of, I, I don't know, I think of kind of squeeze boxes and, and, and um, accordion, little accordions and sailors squeeze boxes, something about sailors about them as well, you know, so I think of that and they, you could smell that, you, you, think, you think of the journey that he had to go there, not so much of him actually being there, you know, and, but the journey that he had to kind of, to kind of go there.